Good morning, everybody. But afterwards, uh, our speakers will switch to English. Im Namen von der Genfer Kantonalbank und meiner hier anwesenden Kollegen möchte ich Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen. Uh, mein Name ist Giorgio Lotto und ich betreue institutionelle Kunden uh, von unserem Zürich Office aus. Uh, kurz zur Hausordnung betreffend Covid. Sobald Sie vom Tisch aufstehen, bitte ich Sie, die Maske anzuziehen. Und ansonsten, fürs Essen ist klar, <lacht> brauchen Sie keine Maske. <lacht> Zu unserem heutigen Anlass möchte ich unsere beiden Redner, die äh, Sie anschließend sehen werden, herzlich begrüßen. Herrn Olivier Scaille, er ist Professor für Finanzen und Statistik am Forschungsinstitut der Uni Genf. Und er verfügt über Forschungserfahrung äh, auf dem Gebiet der Derivatpreisbildung und der ökonometrischen Theorien. Anschließend hören wir Herrn Bruce Kruscher, er ist Head Institutional Portfolio Management bei der Genfer Kantonalbank. Er besitzt ein Master in Finanzwissenschaften der Hochschule Genf und Lausanne und ist auch ein CFA-Holder. Er ist unter anderem verantwortlich für drei Produkte, also Fonds von unserem Haus, die viele von Ihnen noch nicht wissen, Synchrony heißen und nicht mit Banque Contenelle de Genève, sondern Synchrony Fonds. Und er ist verantwortlich für den Swiss Small Midcap, für den All Cap Schweiz und für den High Dividend Schweiz. Außerdem möchte ich unseren CEO Blaise Götschin begrüßen, welcher uns heute mit seiner Anwesenheit beehrt. Die von ihm geführte Bank äh, hat per Juni dieses Jahr eine Kernkapitalquote von 15 Prozent. Die verwalteten Vermögen äh, belaufen sich per Juni auf aktuell 30,9 Milliarden. Davon sind 8,3 Milliarden im Asset Management und unsere Fondsparte, die Synchronie, äh, stellt unseren Investoren 69 Anlagevehikel zur Verfügung. Der Halbjahresgewinn betrug 55,3 Millionen. Diese wurde erwirtschaftet mit knapp 900, äh, Entschuldigung, 800 Mitarbeitern. Wieso haben wir Sie heute eingeladen? Äh, der Grund ist einfach. Was viele von euch noch nicht wissen, ist, die Genfer KB hat sich einem aktiven Anlagestil verpflichtet. Das heißt, wir tanzen nicht um den Benchmark herum, sondern wir haben den Mut, uns vom Index zu entfernen. Manchmal kostet es, manchmal zahlt es sich aus. Längerfristig werden unsere beiden Herren Ihnen das erläutern, ob das gut oder schlecht ist. In diesem Sinne möchte ich Herrn Professor Olivier Skaye das Wort übergeben. Herzlichen Dank. Thank you, Giorgio, for this uh, <coughs> nice introduction. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here. Um, I will, um, so I would like to thank the BCG for, for inviting me to, to talk about one of my, my favorite topic and uh, The topic is about uh, skill, scale, and value creation in the mutual fund industry. Okay, so it's, it's indeed related to uh, the problem of uh, active versus passive management. And uh, what I will try to, to, to show you is uh, some of the results, also because there are a lot of results in the papers. It's an academic study about uh, um, ample evidence of, of skill in the, in the mutual fund industry. Okay, and I will try to convince that it is true. Uh, so the uh, talk is with uh, Laurent Barras, who is uh, one of my former uh, PhD students at the uh, Swiss Finance Institute, and now he's an uh, uh, associate professor at McGill in, in uh, Montreal, and uh, Patrick Gagliardini, who is uh, at uh, uh, Università della Svizzera Italiana, and he's also at the Swiss Finance uh, Institute. And we have several papers uh, now, uh, also in fact uh, related to, to hedge fund, but I will not talk about that uh, about here. Okay, so... Uh, standard talk okay so there will be first of all a motivation i will try to motivate you uh, and explain you why it's important but i think that because you are uh, in the room and because of the topic of the talk uh, and of the event i think that I, i don't really need to to make a lot of motivation then i will uh, present what are the skill measures so what do i mean by skill and we will see that there are two ways to measure skill One is related to what we call investment IDs. Okay, so am I able to generate IDs for my investment? And the second still, uh, the seventh type of skill is am I able to scale up? Okay, so if I 
run uh, one Swiss franc fund or one million Swiss franc fund or one billion Swiss franc fund? Am I able also to uh, cope with the, with the scale uh, and the scalability of my, of my fund? And then I will show you some data and empirical results and I, and I will make some, some conclusion. Okay, so what, what do we know? Okay, so the first part of the talk is in fact very well known. So there is a, a large, and I would say a huge, literature on mutual fund performance, both from the academic side, but also from the practitioner uh, uh, point of view. Okay? So the, that large literature is in fact focusing to a very particular point of view, which is the viewpoint of the investor. Okay? Mm, so the question is, do investors receive positive abnormal returns? And you know that you measure abnormal returns with respect to the alpha of a fund. Okay? Mm. And uh, what do we know? Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, we have evidence of negative and positive net alphas after fees. And this is a very well-known result. So it dates back to uh, Jensen 68, professor at Chicago. So it's very, uh, we know that for a very long time. That in average, okay, if you look at the mutual fund industry after fees, you have a negative performance. Okay, so the alpha will be minus 0.4% in average uh, after, after fees. Okay. Now, of course, it's not because the average guy uh, is losing money uh, that you cannot find some people who are ex doing extremely well or extremely badly. Okay? So I have a, a paper with uh, uh, Laurent Barras and Ross Vermes. You know, it dates back to 10 years ago. Uh, so where, in fact, we also look at the tail of the distribution. Okay? And what do you see? You see that uh, you have close to 40% of uh, funds who generate a positive alpha and 60% uh, who generate a negative alpha. But you can see that some are doing extremely well. If you look at the top five performers, okay, so the alpha will be 1.8% per year. In top of the risk premia that you get from the market, the value, the size, etc. so the other premium. Okay? And so now you can see that uh, some, in fact, are, are losing quite a lot. Okay, so the, tie, uh, the top five worst performers also have a, a minus 2.5%. Okay, so this is what we know, and there are several papers, including uh, uh, the one by myself, uh, who has shown that. Okay, so what do we do in this study? The viewpoint is completely different. Okay, what we do here is we take the viewpoint of funds. Okay, so we look at what is going on before fees, and I will try to decompose so where do I get my alpha? From which type of skill do I get my alpha? Okay, is it because of my investment ideas or is it because I'm able to scale up? Okay, so do funds create value via investment trading skills? If you look at the industry and if you look also at the academic literature, there is a lot of confusion between these two concepts. People will interchange the two notions and the two uh, point of view, they will say that if I see that, in fact, I have evidence of no skill in the mutual fund industry. But this is not true. Okay, so do not mix the viewpoint of the fund manager and the viewpoint of the investor. And I will show you that when you take the viewpoint of the fund manager, uh, so we, we have ample evidence of, uh, of skills. Okay, so this is the, the question that uh, that we want to answer. So can we confirm? And you see that uh, this is Wall Street, okay? So many will enter, few will win. If you take the viewpoint of the investor, the answer is yes. Okay, so indeed, so if you look at uh, the fees, so the fees will eat a lot uh, of, the, of the performance. Now, if you take what we do in this paper, the viewpoint of the fund, the answer is no. Okay, so in fact, many will enter and many will win. Okay, and I will show you that indeed, fund managers are able to generate economic values and they are, uh, uh, generate to, uh, are able to generate an alpha uh, before, uh, before fees. Okay, so you can see that the answer will be totally different depending on whether you take the viewpoint of the investor or the viewpoint of the, of the fund. Okay, so how, how do we measure skills? And this is... Uh, 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 um, it comes from a, a paper by Burke and Green. Burke is a professor at Stanford, and, and you have also a paper by Burke and Van Binsbergen, who is at Wharton. Uh, Green is now dead. 
Uh, we model the dependence between the gross alpha, okay, so the standard alpha of the fund, uh, as a, a linear function. Okay, so we decompose the alpha uh, as a first part. Uh, the first part is AI, and we call that the first dollar alpha. Okay, so what does it tell me? Give me one franc, just one franc, no more. How much am I able to generate as a performance? Okay, so there is no issue about scalability. Okay, I just implement my best ID. Okay, so this is called the first dollar alpha. It measures the ability to detect profitable trades. And of course, it's a paper return uh, because you will never run a one dollar fund or one Swiss franc fund, but you want to scale up. Okay, so this is really an ideal, an ideal case. Okay, so why do we call that the first dollar alpha? Because you can see that if I delete that part, so if I put Q equal to zero, so what is Q? Q is the asset under management. Okay, so when I'll start with one franc, then I will go to one million and then to one billion, I will eat part of my performance because it's much more difficult to run a one billion fund than a one million fund. Okay, so it's quite easy to get, uh, uh, well, quite easy. It's easier to, uh, to get return on, on, on one million than return on one billion. Okay, so this is a size coefficient which corresponds to the trading skills or the scale. So it measures the ability to override capacity constraints. So in fact, it measures what we know in economics as these economies of scale. And when I start to grow, I will have more difficulties to perform well. Okay? So it measures the ability to mitigate uh, execution costs of trading large orders. And what we do in this paper, which is in fact very different with other papers in the literature, you can see that the B is indexed by I. So in fact, it will be fund specific. Okay, I have always found very bizarre uh, to assume a common value B for all funds because you are telling me that whether you run a $1 million fund or $1 billion fund is the same. Okay, of course it's not the same. It's much more difficult in terms of execution cost, trading cost, etc. to run a $1 billion fund. Okay, so here in fact I will look at the heterogeneity in the BI and we will see that the heterogeneity is massive. Okay, so you have really a lot of variance, a lot of variability between the, uh, the coefficient in the, in the population. Okay, so this is really a novelty of the, uh, of the paper. Okay, so again to summarize, so that I'm sure that you get the, uh, the concept uh, very well. Uh, so what are the two dimensions of skill? The first dollar alpha AI, uh, it's about my investment IDs. Okay, so am I able to generate investment IDs? You give me one franc, there is no problem in scaling up. This is a paper return. Okay. The second coefficient, which is called the size coefficient, okay, am I able to scale them up? Okay, and you remember the tale of La Fontaine or Horace. I remember to have to translate that from Latin when I was at Lycée. Okay, so it is the frog who wants to become the ox. Okay, so I want to scale up. Uh, and of course, if I scale too much, I will blow up my performance. Okay, and this is indeed what, what we see in the data. Okay, and so, and we will see that indeed, uh, so when you deliver a negative economic value added, it is because you scale too much. Okay, so in fact, you take too much flows, and, so in, and you run uh, uh, too large asset under management with respect to uh, the investment IDs that you generate. Okay. Okay, so a broader and hot debate. Okay, so uh, it's related to a passive approach. I follow the market and I take a buy and hold strategy. In that case, my investment universe are exchange traded fund. I'm passive, okay, uh, I index. Or uh, I prefer an active approach. I want to beat the market, stock picking and timing. And then my investment universe is made of mutual funds. Okay, so this is in fact a, a hot debate still today, but it's also, as you can see, a very old debate. So again, a professor of Chicago, Malkiel, in his book, Random Walk to Wall Street, and he has a quote. So you take your favorite gorilla, okay? So you take your uh, favorite uh, newspaper, okay? So for example, La Gefi or Financial Times or NZZ, okay? And you give him darts and you ask him to throw darts to the Financial Times, okay? And uh, in fact, your favorite gorilla will do as good as your favorite expert, as your favorite fund manager. Okay? What I will show you uh, in this talk is that in fact the fund manager do better than a gorilla. Okay? For the fund manager who are in the room, they should be happy. 
okay? So, um, yeah, so I, I, will sh I will show you, okay? Okay, a bit of history I like that well, uh, as well. I'm, I'm belgo Swiss, so I like to, to speak a little bit about uh, uh, the, the origin. Uh, what I usually say is that contrary to what uh, uh, U.S. professors think, mutual fund, the mutual fund industry has not been invented in the U.S. Okay, in fact, it was uh, invented in, in Europe, and it was uh, invented by an Amsterdam broker, Amran van Ketwich, and you can see that it dates back to the 18th century. And he launched his first mutual fund, which was called Eendracht Macht Macht, uh, which is Union Makes Strength, and in fact, is the motto of Belgium, l'Union fait la force. And uh, his idea was to invest in uh, sovereign bonds, which are still popular, bank bonds, which are really popular, and plantation laws, and you can see them as the green bonds of the 18th century, okay? But what was the main objective? The main objective was uh, to offer benefits of portfolio diversification to retail investors, okay? So you have a big pie, that big pie is called a mutual fund, you take slices and you sell the slices to the retail investor, okay? So this was really the idea of that, uh, of that broker, okay? Now the first value fund, okay? So please meet the Warren Buffett, uh, the Warren Buffett of uh, the 18th century, okay? So it's the first value strategy. So he launched his second fund named Concordia Res Parvet Crescent. And his idea was to invest in solid securities and those that based on decline in their price would merit spe speculation and could be purchased below their intrinsic values of which one has every reason to expect an important benefit. Okay, so this is really a value strategy. Okay, so you try to buy undervalued stock in order to expect higher return in the, in the future. Okay, why to show you that? It's because I will show you that the investment style will play a key role in the trading skills versus investment ideas. Okay, so and in particular, I will focus on the difference between large cap and small cap. Uh, in, uh, in some of the appendices of the paper, you also have a, a comparison between value and growth, uh, growth funds, uh, growth strategies. Okay, so what are the data? The data are uh, pretty standard, okay? So it's a US data, because we uh, try to publish in, in top, uh, top US journal. Uh, our mutual fund data consists of open-end, actively managed US equity funds. Uh, you see that you will have a fairly large uh, number of funds, uh, above 2,000. Uh, we use monthly return data from the CRISP. You are now revising the paper to in also look at uh, daily data. The sample period is from uh, 79 and we have extended to 2018 in the, in the revised version. And we use a four-factor model based on traded indices as benchmark model. Okay, so this is also quite a novelty in the sense when I discuss with practitioners, they often say that uh, to me, but Olivier, what you are doing is you are benchmarking with factors which are not tradable. Okay, because they are fictively made of long short uh, uh, portfolio. So here we look at really traded indices, so Russell indices, which target uh, 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 value and size, uh, size indices. So they are really investable. Okay. So we, we get rid of that, that critique. What are the results? Okay, so let us me first focus on the whole population. So I look at my 2,000 uh, funds, and if you remember, I have two dimensions for my skill. Okay, so I have my investment IDs uh, and I have my second skill dimension, uh, the frog. Okay, and I want to, to see uh, how they differ. Okay, so what do we have? We see that we have ample evidence of positive first dollar alpha. Okay, look at the percentage, it's annual. Mm, so it means that in average, if you give a mutual fund manager one franc to invest, he will generate 3.2% annual. In top, of the risk premia coming from the market, the size, the momentum, okay, and the value, okay, so it's, a, it's quite, quite big, okay. Now look at um, the percentage, and this is where also you get uh, good news, the vast majority, okay, so you have close to 90% of the mutual fund manager generate a positive first dollar alpha, okay, so you only have a minority of the fund, 12% or 10%, will, will generate a negative alpha. Okay, so Burke and Van Wiesbergen call them the charlatans. Okay, so it means that if you give them just one dollar, even with one dollar, one three francs, they manage to lose money. So this is the guy that you want to stay away. Okay. 
Now you can see that some are really charlatans. So the worst performers will eat minus 0.5% a year. Okay, so big negative returns. Uh, but you can see that you have also some stellar performers uh, in terms of first dollar alpha. It will be 9% a year. Okay, so these guys are definitely skilled in terms of generating investment IDs. Okay. Now the second dimension is I will now go from one dollar to 10 million to one billion. So I want to scale up. Okay, so this is a second dimension, the BI. There we have ample evidence of scalability issue. Okay, so the average is 1.5. So here, in fact, we standardize for comparison. So it's terms of one uh, standard deviation. Okay, so if you increase by one standard, one standard deviation the uh, size of your fund, uh, it will eat 1.5% a year. Okay, so to give you a more concrete idea, uh, in average, if I increase my fund by $100 million, $100 million, it will eat 0.2% of your alpha. Okay, well, this is the scalability issue that, that you have, okay, in average. Now, of course, uh, so you can see that you have also uh, a lot of differences, so ample evidence of uh, positive BI, uh, so of scalability issue, some negative 30 points, so in fact, this is uh, economies of scale, okay, and uh, you can see that some are indeed, uh, so uh, really face troubles in terms of, of, of scalability. Okay, so this is the result if you look at the whole population. Okay, now you remember Warren Buffett. Okay, so I can now play different style strategies. Okay, so what you can do is you can start to look at small cap. Okay, so the idea here will be to focus on small cap. Okay, and then I will show you the result of, of large cap. Okay, so again, my two dimension, first dollar alpha and uh, uh, my scale coefficient. So look at the, the result. So the average. Now you, you are at 4.9% in terms of investment ID. Okay, so close to 5%. This is really the vast majority. Okay, so 91% of the small cap fund generate a positive first dollar alpha. So it's really uh, the, the bulk of the population. Again, stellar performance within small cap. So it's 11.8% annual. So this is really... Uh, really a uh, big amount, okay, and some are losing money, so the 5% uh, lower performers uh, are at minus 0.1%, okay. So when you see that, uh, you see, well, then I'm really happy, okay, because this guy will generate a lot of alpha. Yes, but be careful, because there is the other side of skills, which is a scalability issue. And of course, when you invest in a small cap, it will be difficult to scale up. Because the maximum that you can do is buy the whole firm. When you have bought the small cap, you cannot buy more. Okay, so you will be stuck. Okay, and this is exactly what we see. Okay, so you can see that the average is much bigger than, than before. Mm, so you see that indeed you have uh, some coefficient here which are quite big, so 5.1%. Uh, so you have really a huge evidence of scalability issue for small cap. Okay. So the main message here for, pra for practitioners, for industry people, is that when you invest in a small cap fund, be careful of the size and monitor how the guy is growing, okay? Because if go, he is grow uh, uh, beyond a, a given point, uh, it will be really hit by that uh, scalability issue, okay? So this is for the small cap. Large cap, well, guess it will be exactly the reverse. Okay, so for large cap, uh, it's very difficult to generate investment IDs. Okay, so it's very difficult to, uh, if you look at the S&P 500, it's, it's quite difficult to get good investment IDs. Okay, so if you look at the average is much, low, uh, much lower than in the small caps, so 1.9 instead of 4%. Positive uh, percentage of positive first dollar alpha drops to 80% instead of 91%. And look at the charlatans, okay? So you see that now you have one-fifth uh, of the mutual fund uh, manager who will generate negative uh, 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 first dollar alpha, okay? Well, and you are here at 1.7, but still uh, you have some who perform uh, quite well uh, at 5.9, okay? So this will also show you uh, that contrary to what a lot of academic people do, 
you face a huge heterogeneity in the population. Okay, so it's really important to develop statistical tools and econometric tools, and this is what we also do in this paper. There is a, an econometric methodology, you know, really to analyze the heterogeneity in the population. Okay, and not just say that this fund will behave exactly the same way as this uh, other fund. Okay, so you need to, uh, to develop some, some uh, data analysis tool. So this is not a, uh, a good message, okay, but on the contrary, uh, here you will have a small evidence of scalability issue. Okay, so it's difficult to find good investment ideas, but there is no problem in scaling up. Okay, if you invest in blue chips, well, I can I have a lot of depth in the investment. Okay, so here you can see that indeed uh, the average for the scale is much lower, mm, and you can see that indeed uh, so uh, five percent up is only a two point nine percent. Okay, so difficult to find good investment ID, but no problem in scaling up. Mm, I can. I can run e easily a 1 billion fund or 30 billion fund, as you can see sometimes in the US, if I invest in blue chips, no problem. Okay, so I have a lot of depth in the, in the market. Now again, uh, a distinction between uh, two other strategies, so low turnover fund versus uh, high turnover fund. Okay, so low turnover fund, uh, so you have uh, a small evidence of positive uh, first dollar alpha. Okay, so you are at 2.8, and uh, again, a percentage of positive, which is at, uh, at, uh, at 80%. Uh, some are, uh, again, uh, performing extremely well, 9.4%. Uh, but you have, again, small evidence of scalability issue. Okay, so what is the narrative here? Very easy. If I have a low turnover, I don't turn my portfolio, so I will not face any transaction cost. Okay. I invest and I stay, okay? So I don't, I don't have the problem of rotation and generating a lot of, uh, of transaction cost, okay? So this is, this is what we get for the, for the low uh, turnover fund. Now the high turnover fund, okay? And this is uh, something that, uh, that I like a lot. Uh, um, if I look at the high turnover fund, uh, so the ID, so in fact, there are two opposite IDs in the academic literature, okay? So you can have a high turnover, so it means that you rotate a lot your position because you have a lot of investment IDs, okay? So you change often your investment strategies, okay? And indeed, you can see that, mm, so it's, it pays out 11%, okay? But look at this, and this is the other side, uh, and academic people say that sometimes mutual fund managers rotate a lot their portfolio just to try to fool you to make you think that they have investment IDs, but they don't, okay? So they don't want to sit because it's very, very difficult to sit uh, on, on a position and you want to signal to your investor that you have a lot of investment IDs. But if you don't, then it will, in fact, uh, 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 generate to a lower performance. Uh, and indeed, you can see that here, and this was uh, uh, where well, it confirms some of the academic studies, uh, that if you look at uh, a large, uh, high turnover, sometimes be careful, uh, and you see that here the percentage of the charlatans are again very high. Okay, and so you can see that you have really a lot of heterogeneity in the population. Okay, so you will have indeed uh, charlatans, uh, but you will also have people who uh, uh, trade often because they have a lot of uh, new new ideas. Okay. Uh, we have huge evidence, of course, of scalability issues. Because if uh, you make a lot of turnover, uh, so it means that you will have a lot of transaction cost uh, and uh, you have really uh, a problem uh, in, in, in scalability, okay? And uh, again, 1.7, so 5.3, uh, so uh, really problem of scalability issue in that, uh, in that, uh, in that area. So take home, ha take home message, okay? So what uh, do I want you to take home when, when, when you leave the, the event? If I'm good at generating investment IDs, okay? So I have a large first dollar alpha coefficient. I face scalability issue. So I will also have problem in scaling up. So I will also suffer a large BI. If I'm good on the country at mitigating scalability issue, I'm able to run a very, very large fund, 30 billion, for example. 
I will face investment IDs issue a small i. Okay, so you can see that I will have large, large, uh, or small, small. And indeed, if you look at the correlation, and we are the first to show that because we really anal make an, an, an analysis fund per fund, and uh, not on the whole population. So the correlation in the whole population between AI and BI is huge. It will be 82%. Okay, so what is the main message here? It's very difficult to be skilled in the two dimension. Okay, so either you are, uh, you are skilled in generating investment IDs, uh, or you are uh, uh, skilled at uh, managing scalability issue. Okay, and for people who have uh, had uh, uh, business administration uh, education, they should recognize something uh, that you know well. Okay, so if you look at the life cycle of a product, okay, in fact, you have two types of innovation. The first innovation is called the product innovation. Am I able uh, to invent the next iPhone? Okay, this is investment ID. Am I able to generate IDs, product innovation? And then the next step is process innovation. Am I able to scale up? Am I able to produce one billion iPhones? Okay, and this is how am I able to manage and to handle the process of production? And this is exactly the same here. Okay, so here this will correspond to product innovation, investment IDs, and this corresponds to, in fact, also uh, process innovation. Am I able uh, to make it? And if you look at the, uh, the mutual fund industry, uh, so some mutual fund will market this, and other mutual fund will market that. Okay, so if you look at big fund in the, in the, in the US, uh, they often market that type of stuff. Uh, they are able to run a 30 billion fund because they have all the, the process to uh, to run that, okay? So they are very efficient in hiding their orders in the market and, and so on, okay? So the, 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 the take-home message here, uh, there is a clear trade-off between the two dimensions of skills. It is difficult to be skilled in both, okay? And this is one of the main message of the, of the paper. Now, this is new results also that we have, uh, and, and we were really happy with that, uh, uh, with that uh, 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 picture. Okay, so... Um, if you believe in the Burke and Green model, so uh, it means that there, are, there is the first dollar alpha and there is the, the size coefficient. It's possible if I know my own AI and my own BI, as a fund manager, it's possible to determine the optimal value under management that I should not go beyond in order to maximize my rent, in order to maximize my economic value. Okay. What is the idea here is to compare that optimal strategy. Okay. As a fund manager, I know my AI, I know my BI, I know my first dollar alpha, I know my scale coefficient. I compute my optimal size okay, that I have to run. And then what we do is we compare that optimum. So you cannot beat that, you cannot beat that optimum. It's the best that you can do. You will maximize your economic value added to your hand. And what we compare is what you observe in the population. So what mutual fund manager indeed do. Okay? And uh, these are the sub-periods. Okay? So you, you look at the whole history of all funds. You chop it uh, in 10 sub-periods. And you compare the deviation with respect to the optimum, with the optimal size. Mm? And look at what you, you see. And I really like that pattern. When you are young, Okay, so you have to convince the investor that you have investment IDs. Okay, so if you are able to do that, funds will come. Uh, sorry, flows will come. Okay, so you start to grow. Okay, you grow, you grow, you, you grow. And then you continue to, to have inflows. You don't say no. Okay, and then you overshoot. Okay, and you overshoot. So it means that you are too large the BI will start to kick in and will eat your performance. The, investment, the investor will see that, okay, that you in fact destroy the rent, the destroy the value, and then you will have outflows. Okay, and indeed, this is what you see. So the investor and the fund manager, so sometimes the manager close down their fund, okay, and you see a, a, a reversion to, to the optimal. Okay, so we are the first really to show that uh, quantitatively. Okay, so it's based on data. We don't do that by hand. Okay, so, uh, okay, so um, 
that we are still uh, looking at uh, that to have more, uh, more insights. Now for investor, okay, so what I have shown you is the viewpoint of the fund manager. Let me look at the viewpoint of the, the investor, which is after fees, okay. This is exactly the same numbers uh, that, I, that I show you before, okay. So the average is minus 0.4 percent, okay. 40 percent has a positive alpha, but 60 percent have a negative alpha. You can see that some uh, have really uh, a negative uh, uh, the lowest uh, uh, performers have a negative minus 2.5 percent. Okay, so what does it uh, what does it mean? And, and this is a little bit puzzling uh, for uh, for an academic, is that the fund managers are able to benefit from their skills uh, through charging fees and are in bargaining power with respect to the investors. Okay, so so why is it puzzling for an academic? Is why these guys still do exist? Okay, so why in the investor are not realizing mm, then mm, they indeed uh, have a negative performance after, after fees, okay? And this is, there are some explanations in the, in the academic literature, but it's still, it's, it's still very puzzling, at least very puzzling for me. Okay, so conclusion, very Swiss. Uh, in this paper, we examine a mutual fund skill by developing a novel analysis based on the skill decomposition in a first dollar alpha and a size coefficient at the fund level. And I really insist on that, it's really at the fund level. Okay, so it's not a common B, we really exploit the heterogeneity and this has a huge information in the heterogeneity at the, the population level. And there are more and more econometrics, for example, in labor economics, where they also try to look at the heterogeneity that you have in the households. So managers are definitely skilled at detecting profitable trades, okay, but they are often unskilled or at least less skilled at overriding capacity constraints. Uh, again, mm. uh, um, catching line, okay, so great investment ideas are difficult to scale up, okay. Overall, the fund profits from exploiting skill are large and close to the optimal level in the long run. So this came up, in fact, really as a surprise. Uh, we were not expecting that the mutual fund manager were able to endogenize uh, their AI and their BI and to be close uh, to the optimal level. Okay, so this was really surprising. Okay, now of course it's the average; it's not true for all the all the funds, uh, and we have uh, uh, some funds who are really too big with respect to their investment IDs. Okay, and then uh, finally, so funds have skills but they also have bargaining power, huh? so they are able to internalize uh, their hands uh, by charging uh, fees uh, in order uh, to get uh, for themselves the performance and the economic rent that they, they generate. Okay. So thank you, this is all. So I'll, Bruce, you take the, take the lead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to explain uh, in, in, the, in the next 15 minutes how I will um, do my best to beat this, uh, your favorite gorillas that Mr. Skye talked to you about. So uh, I am Bruce Krasha, head of uh, institutional portfolio management at BCGE, and I'm running two, uh, three uh, actually uh, funds on Swiss equities, two which are really active, actively managed fund and one which is more thematic on high dividend companies. Here, the idea is to show you how we try to generate this alpha, what is our investment process to do it, and what is the result of this um, approach that we have on the, on the Swiss market. But first, let me start with show you this chart, which is to me very compelling, and the, the title is really active. Is the uh, actively managed fund on Swiss equity really active? And you can see uh, on this chart that, is uh, that there is a lot of heterogeneity heterogeneity uh, by uh, funds. The number of holdings varies very much from one fund to another and this is uh, showing you 13 dots and all of those dots are one fund. Uh, those are the m usual suspects on the Swiss equity uh, universe and you can see that the range is quite large. So there are funds that have 22 holdings, that's the lowest that you can find on the market and that's us. Uh, you will see later on that we are convinced about high conviction investing, so very few uh, large conviction in the fund. 
and it goes up to 70 uh, holdings. So to me, clearly, that's the kind of people that Mr. Skye talked to you about charlatan. That's not actively managed fund. They have the fee structure of an active, uh, actively managed fund, but they have close to 70 position, which is way too much to be really active in this environment. And you can clearly see that the uh, inverse cor correlation between the number of holdings and the tracking error. So of course, the more holdings you have, the less active you are if you consider tracking error a good measure of the level of, uh, of activeness in a, in a fund. Uh, there is this quote from Mr. Buffett, and I think every uh, financial presentation needs to have a quote from Mr. Buffett. So I'll, I'll say one to, uh, for, for the record. Uh, but it just says that diversification is protection against ignorance. And I think that's the key message here. We know our company, we know our investment thesis, uh, we go in depth into the analysis of company, and that's why we don't need to over diversify. And 22 is, uh, is, is way enough in order to have a fund that is uh, uh, um, diversified. So the investment process that we have uh, is pretty simple. So we start with the universe. For this fund that I will show you uh, uh, thereafter, that's the SPI, 214 members currently. Uh, then we do a fundamental analysis of companies, and I'll show you in a minute what do we mean by that. And we finish by a fund that has between 20 to 30 companies, and most of the time it's close, closer to the lower end of this range. So currently 22 companies, the maximum I've ever had is 24, so really more close to the 20 than the 30 companies. So how do we define fundamental analysis? How do we construct those high conviction? Uh, how do we build those? So first and foremost, we need to understand the business model of the company. We need to understand the product, the services. We need to understand what the industry looks like, what the competition looks like, everything that is key to really understand and to make an investment thesis, to generate investment ideas. Then we need to meet with these companies. And I think in those difficult times, it's, it's not that easy, but we need to have this close link to them just to better understand this business model, the growth prospect, the margin prospect, and everything. So we do uh, between 50 to 60 meetings per year with C-level members in order to discuss uh, the, the investment thesis that we have uh, on this company. Then uh, we look at the financial statement, of course, of the company, historical one, but we also do forecast. And those uh, will help us build uh, an intrinsic valuation for this company. So we use DCF model to have our own target prices. And those target prices are the key for us to invest or to sell uh, a company. So you see a very fundamental way of looking at investment. We're not having any momentum into that. We're not doing any trading for the short-term horizon. We are long-term based investors, and we're doing that for, uh, into our fundamental analysis. So how do we build this conviction? There is three steps for that. The first one is to first look at the attractiveness of the industry, because we believe that even a good company cannot perform well in, a, in an industry that is currently challenged. So we look at very basic, basic things about an industry. So first, the low risk of new entrants, low risk of substitution. We look at the level of competition into the industry. We want that competition is here because it's, it's I think, healthy to have some competition to stay on top of your game, but not too much. We don't want to be invested in industries where there is overcapacity, and we'll see some example thereafter. Uh, because it puts too much pressure on prices. And we want to have industry that, are, uh, um, that rely on structural growth driver, be it demographic, technology, uh, sustainability, uh, you name it. But we want the, this industry to grow uh, in order to find companies that will grow even, even further than that. So concrete example of industries that we like and dislike currently. Uh, we like the flavor and fragrances industry. I'll, I'll talk to you about Givaudan in a minute. We like the CDMO industries, so that's the subcontracting uh, for the pharma industries. That's the Lonza, Siegfried of this world. Uh, we like sanitary product. Uh, always been a big fan of Geberit. Uh, earring care solution, so here you will uh, uh, get the idea of Sonova, dental provider with Stroman. And we also like 
lots of niche markets such as vacuum valves that are used in the semiconductor industry. We like damper actuator. There, there are lots of those in this room. I'll talk to you uh, in a minute. That's a strong investment case that I have currently. Uh, we like intralogistic with company like Interol. Uh, and in those times where lots of people are not going to the shop anymore, but ordering online, you need more and more uh, intralogistic uh, uh, services and goods. The unattractive industries currently are for us the banks. There are no banks in the fund. The reinsurance market, just because there is still overcapacity in it. Uh, the cement market, for the same reason, uh, too much overcapacity in the cement industry. Staffing, because there is too much technology risk into the staffing sector currently. And telecommunications, simply because there is no growth into this sector. Once we've said that the industry is attractive, we go one step further and we look at the attractiveness of the investment of the company. Sorry, so here uh, the key for us is the intangible assets uh, because those are har hard to replicate by uh, the competition. So brands, R&D, technology, everything that is not easily replicable, we will look for companies that have strong intangible assets. We look for strong management team, of course, high pricing power, uh, low volatility of sales growth, uh, that means we like a company that has visibility. Of course, uh, in those times, it's, it's not really easy to find, but there are some. Uh, we like asset light business model, high return on invested capital that must be higher than the cost of capital. The company needs to create value for the shareholder. And we like companies that have strong free cash flow generation, of course, because we use model based on free cash flow. So we're looking for companies with uh, strong free cash flow generation. So again, two examples here of what we currently like uh, as a company. Uh, the first one is Givaudan. I think all of you uh, knows quite well the, the company. The global leader in flavor and fragrances, 26% market share. Uh, what is quite striking is the, the robust organic growth profile of the company. Since the IPO, 4.5% average organic growth. So that's quite uh, striking. I call this company recession proof, never had any year of negative organic growth. To give you an idea, the first nine months of Givaudan in 2020, they've shown a bit less than 4% organic growth despite the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is a company with a very strong EBDA margin, 24%, up 140 basis points this year alone. So they keep growing this margin that's very uh, attractive in terms of return. They gener generate 15% of sales in free cash flow, so highly cash generative business. They invest a lot in R&D, and that's maybe key uh, to my investment thesis in Givaudan. They invest close to 10% of sales in research and development each year. And if you look at absolute numbers, that's f on more than 500 um, uh, million Swiss francs each year, much more than the closest competitors, uh, Firmenich and IFF or even Simrise. So these guys invest a lot, they're the leaders, and they're innovating a lot, which drive organic growth. Another company is uh, Bellimo, and I was talking to you before of the actuator solution that you might find in this room and in this building. So those uh, uh, little boxes, orange boxes, can help you to, uh, to uh, mitigate the flow of air and water into buildings. So that's a strong play into energy efficiency, Bellimo, of course. Uh, so that's a very small niche into their uh, in. They're the strong market leader into that niche, 15, 50, 50% market share. Uh, that's a growth story for sure. 10% uh, organic growth in 18, 9% in 19. This year, of course, it's going to be affected by the crisis, but the organic growth should be around flat. So uh, not that uh, terrible for them. Uh, really high EBIT margin for an industrial company, 20% of, uh, of EBIT margin. They invest 7% of sales in research and development, and this number is growing. That's what I like about uh, this company as well. Highly cash generative, 15% of sales in free cash flow. And last but not least, a very strong balance sheet because they have no debt. Uh, net debt to ABDA is minus 1.1, so they are net cash. So uh, that was the second step, look at the attractiveness of the company, but because a good company is not always a good investment, then there is the last step, which is the attractiveness of the investment per se. 
and here I will use my financial modeling uh, and, and, uh, and forecast to build a model, a DCF model, and I will get a target price for those companies. And you will see that I will only invest in companies in which there are sufficient upside, and I will sell them once they've reached my target price. So that's quite easy and straightforward way to, to work. So two examples here again, uh, Givaudan, which I talked to you before. So target price currently uh, 4,600 Swiss francs. So there, has, th there is around 15% upside on Givaudan currently, uh, according to my estimates. So I'm still uh, very much invested. That's my biggest active position in the fund. And another great company, good industry, but not a great investment uh, uh, to, to, uh, to my point of view, is Linden Sprungli, uh, where the target price is 7,000 Swiss francs, which is around 10% below current prices. So I'm not invested in Lind just because of that. And it was to give you this idea how I work, only invest where I can find sufficient upside. I have no uh, um, underweight in my fund, only active weight. So you can see here the, the summary of my current positioning for the fund, uh, the 10 biggest active weights. So of course, we have a bias towards quality companies. That's for sure. I recognize that. I have no problem with that. Quality companies are expensive, but for, for a reason. Uh, and that's the, the work that I'm doing all day. Just uh, be sure that they're not too expensive uh, for the quality they, they show. So uh, my biggest active weights are Lanza, Givaudan, Partners Group, VAT, Sikag, Eberich, Trauman, Belimo, Sonova, and, and Interol. So you can see that there is a good mix of large cap blue chips and uh, smaller uh, companies. And not invested, I said before, on banks. So no big banks in the fund. I recently sold Alcon, no Swiss Ray, no Lafarge Old Team, Swisscom, Swiss Life, Adeco, or Linta Unsprungli. The result of that, uh, so that's the fund that I'm uh, running since uh, 2016. Uh, and you can see that we've outperformed quite heavily the market, 38% uh, alpha uh, since the launch in March 2012. Uh, that's performance after fees. Uh, and that's uh, what maybe uh, got us to have this Morningstar Award for the best Swiss equity fund in 2020, um, which is an award that I quite like uh, because it's not only performance, but adjusted by risk. So coming back to this idea of diversification, I really think that I have sufficient diversification with 22 companies. There is no need to get more to get lower risk. And, uh, and that's maybe a, a, a concrete example that uh, we're not higher risk because we are more concentrated. We have strong conviction and we do not want to dilute them with other uh, conviction or not, no conviction in the fund. Ich hoffe, dass wir Ihr Wissen erweitern konnten und das Einzige, was ich Ihnen wünsche, ist viel Gesundheit. Herzlichen Dank. <lacht>